Good morning. Good morning. Your Excellency, Ambassador Jaidip Sarkar, Your Eminence, Honorable Members of the Royal Government of Bhutan, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls. Welcome to our second day of Mountain Echoes, the eighth edition of the biggest and most wonderful literary festival in Bhutan. Today, we have a long and full program that I am sure you will enjoy greatly. And so that we can all enjoy it fully, please take a moment now to ensure that your mobile phone is indeed on silent, please. Please don't forget that outside of this building, we have our wonderful stalls. So please make use of the intervals of our tea breaks and lunch break to have a look at all the very interesting organizations that are presenting their work to you in these stalls just in front of the building. Please, when you make photos, do use our hashtags because in the modern era, it is our way of presenting what we do here to the wider world. So please use the hashtag Mountain Echoes, Lit Fest, Author Instagram, and all the other variations um, that you may have heard of before. And I will be reminding you throughout the day. Now, also to remind you that we are continuing tomorrow. A lot of you may be very excited about today, but Sunday, we also have a very full program, not just here, but also at the Taj. And especially if you're interested in themes of um, leadership, teamwork, entrepreneurship, then the Taj tomorrow may be a venue you really want to check out. I mean, you have the unique opportunity of spending time with us here at RUB and seeing a very different but equally engaging program at the Taj. So please don't forget about the Taj tomorrow. Don't forget about tomorrow. I would like to now start with our most interesting and engaging discussion, which is called the Inglorious Empire. And as the name suggests, it holds um, some reference to a problematic past. So on the 17th year of independent India, Dr. Shashi Tharoor takes the stage to remind us of the past that has molded the India of today. In conversation with Jyoti Malhotra, the author brings to light the hypocrisies of the Raj and the trauma of the colonized. So please, I would like you to join me in welcoming Dr. Shashi Tharoor and Jyoti Malhotra to the stage. Good morning. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to Mountain Echoes, to the second day of Mountain Echoes. We have um, this amazing program all day, as, as the announcer just said. And I have with me the inimitable Shashi Tharoor, Member of Parliament from Tiruvannantapuram which is in the deep south of India, in Kerala, one of the few states that is still not ruled by the BJP. So Shashi, you have the honor of, uh, of being in the opposition. Holding the fort. Holding the fort. I am Jyoti Malhotra. I'm a journalist in Delhi. I write for the uh, Indian Express newspaper. Now, I thought that uh, our session today is titled Inglorious Empire. And of course, India has just cel celebrated 70 years of independence, of freedom from British rule uh, alongside the partition of uh, the country. But I thought it, would, it might be nice because we're in Bhutan to, to sort of contextualize. We could sort of compare them with the Indian experience. So for example, in 1616, 
And yesterday, Her Majesty, the, the, the Royal Queen Mother, talked about how Shabdrung Rinpoche came from Tibet to Bhutan in 1616 and began to propagate the wheel of dharma. And it's in 16, six, only 16 years before that, Shashi, as you write in your book, The Era of Darkness, that um, the British East India Company set up shop in India. Uh, India was then under Aurangzeb, the much maligned Aurangzeb, controlled or accounted for 27% of the world's economy. Then in 1865, the Treaty of Sinchula between Bhutan and um, the British Empire, which was then ruling Delhi. And one of the most important elements of this treaty, of course, was that Bhutan, that while the British uh, said that they would guide Bhutan's foreign relations, but they conceded that Bhutan would remain an independent country, never, never to be colonized like India was, the jewel in its crown. Now that's followed by 1910, the Treaty of Punaka, uh, between, again, again Wongchuk, Wongchuk has by now unified uh, Bhutan and, um, and he, he, he becomes the hereditary ruler of Bhutan in 1907. In India, meanwhile, in 1906, the Muslim League has just been formed in Dhaka and um, the partition of Bengal has just taken place. 1911, just one year after the Treaty of Punaka, Finally, the Imperial Darbar moves from Calcutta to New Delhi. Now, these dates, I'm just hoping, Shashi, if you can contextualize these dates and talk a little bit about this. The book that, the last book, the last, the, the, I think this is your 18th book that you've written. 16th, actually. 16th, okay. But encourage me, go. <laughs> okay. Uh, which was, gosh, you have an... Uh, you, you have high approval rate in the audience, you don't need me. <laughs> but, but tell us a little bit about this book and why you wrote it, um, evidently from the speech that you, that you delivered. At, at right, the actually, yes, it is, it is an unusual thing that a book emerges from a speech, but I, uh, I had been invited uh, to, to participate in an Oxford Union debate on British colonialism. Their topic was that Britain owes reparations to her former colonies, and uh, I personally was not very keen on the reparations angle, but I seized on the topic as an opportunity to actually do a sort of summary of why indeed Britain owed at least a moral debt to India and to her other colonies. Uh, and on the reparations front, I actually said just, you know, a, a symbolic one pound a year for the next 200 years would pay that moral debt, but it wasn't a monetary matter because I felt you couldn't really quantify the damage that had been done. Britain came to one of the richest countries in the world. Uh, in fact, in 1700, it was the richest country in the world, accounting for 27% of GDP. And as late as 1800, it was the second richest at 23% of global GDP. And over 200 years of depredations, loot, and pillage, Britain reduced it to one of the poorest countries in the world, a poster child for third world poverty and despair, uh, leaving in 1947 uh, a shambles behind. Uh, that, that original Brexit uh, really, in many ways, demonstrated the futility of the entire enterprise. But these 200-odd years, difficult to put a very precise date, most people date the rise of the British Empire in India to 1757, the Battle of Plassey, when Clive uh, essentially acquired a large chunk of territory in Bengal, uh, and then gradually, of course, the British spread until they controlled the entire subcontinent uh, by the early 19th century. And then um, the crown officially took over in the middle of the 19th century, but already earlier, uh, from about the 1770s, the East India Company was merely a mask for the British crown because it was actually um, a company whose work in India was being supervised by the British Parliament. Uh, now, to cut a long story short, um, in talking about all of this, I just went through uh, a, a number of... Uh, key points of what the British had done and not, had not done. And uh, when the Oxford Union uh, posted this speech on the web, uh, somewhat to my surprise, it went viral to an extent that really was astonishing. I mean, I've had a few speeches of mine that have had a few million viewers over a number of years, but this had three million viewers in 24 hours and so on, and it became quite astonishingly widespread, being downloaded widely, being talked about. And my publisher said, you've got to make it into a book. And my reaction was, why bother? Surely everyone knows this already. 
to which uh, everyone in India is what I meant. And, and his answer was, no, they don't, because if they did, your speech wouldn't have gone viral, which seemed to make some sense. And that's why I wrote the book, essentially two things. One is to lay out the indictment of the British Raj, but the second was to take the defense of the Raj that is all too common, especially in these last 10 or 15 years. A number of books have been published uh, praising the Raj and claiming that they, the Raj laid the foundations for all of India's successes today. And so I take those arguments as well and refute them one by one, demonstrating how all the supposed benefits of the Raj were actually brought in to serve British interests and not Indian ones. But Jashi, and that's the, the, the broad sorry, theme yeah. of the book. So. No, so, you know, what's the problem with atonement that the British people have or the British government have? You, you say in your book that Willy Brandt, then Chancellor of Germany in 1970, when he goes to, to, our, to Poland and sort of falls on his knees and apologizes for Auschwitz and the concentration camps during the Second World War. More recently, Justin Trudeau apologizes for Komagatamaru, and which in 1916, as we know, was the shit that and the Canadian government refused to let Indian immigrants on board. So well, what's, the, really. they were, so what's yeah. the problem with Britain? Why is it that the Queen, when she came in 97, refused to say sorry for Jallianwala Bagh? What is it about England? It's a good question. One of the comments that was made to me by a senior British official, and I can't name him because it was a private conversation. Yeah, you could. We're was, in Bhutan. <laughs> <laughs> private conversation. But he did say, look, the problem is that if we say sorry to you lot, we'll be saying sorry in 190 countries around the world. Uh, which is, I mean, you know, only a slight exaggeration. I mean, a place like Singapore was a barren rock before the British built it, so you can't really say they have anything to apologize for there, uh, except to the Indian laborers whom they transported over to build Singapore. But uh, in a country like India, which was a flourishing civilization and a flourishing economy, uh, which had a thriving textile industry, a thriving shipbuilding industry, a thriving steel industry, all of which the British systematically destroyed to replace with British equivalents. Um, there, there is a different kind of atonement required, and the British have had some difficulty, I think, in coming to terms what with it. What is this difficulty? You know, I don't want to dwell on it too much, but what is it? No, I, I think the difficulty is partly a question of historical amnesia. That is, they have allowed themselves to forget uh, the fact that they are where they are today because of these centuries of exploitation of others. It's partly to do with a self-glorifying romanticization of the Raj, that has taken place notably on television, mm -hmm. where you've got shows like Indian Summers and Power Pavilions and so on over the years, which have somehow really glamorized the British as do-gooders out there to civilize the savage land, which of course um, is, is a travesty of, of what actually happened. And then I think partly there is, um, to put it bluntly, uh, a certain unwillingness to believe they did wrong. I mean, there's a startling number of polls. YouGov does a poll every year in which they ask the question, and it's mainly young people who answer YouGov polls, uh, about what you think about the empire. And a startling number of people still say they are proud of the empire and would love to have it back. Yeah. They would still like there to be a British empire. So there's this un unreconstructed nostalgia as well. Now, all of this combined together, I think, explains the attitude. So, you know, to, to look at the Indian uh, equivalent, now we've just celebrated 70 years of freedom, but I would have thought that the partition of India that accompanied freedom, that there would have been a much more of a catharsis. But we did celebrate freedom. I mean, there were lots of sort of exhibitions and film shows, but there wasn't that, you know, that moment that coming out that, yes, we were divided, that there was the British Empire, but apart from blaming the empire, just what we've done with the countries of Bangladesh and Pakistan. Why do you think that there is this amnesia in some sort, in some form in, in India as well? I'm not sure that's fair, Jyoti. First of all, history occupies a different place in people's imaginations. For example, the construction of the Partition Museum in Amritsar, I think, is a wonderful idea, and I'm, I'm certainly hoping there'll be more of this sort of thing. I've said to the British, you've got an imperial war museum, you don't have an imperial colonialism museum. You can drive through London and come across a statue to the animals that fought on the British side in the two world wars. There is no statue to the Indian soldiers who fought on the, for the Allies. And there are 1.3 million in the First World War and 1.7 million in the Second World War, and there's no statue to them. Uh, tens of uh, thousands of them died for the British. But 
there is this, I'm, I'm, you know, I, I don't want to fling lightly about words like racism and so on, but I'm just saying it's a different order of magnitude. The second thing is that things like Pakistan and Bangladesh are live issues. We cannot sit down and take a detached view of Pakistan because we have terrorists coming across the border from Pakistan every day. It's, it's, it's a live problem for us to deal with. So I, I just don't think you can compare the two. The time will come when we can look back, perhaps with more we objectivity. We haven't come to terms with it, in a sense. It will take time. It will take time. But with the, with the British, for example, it, it was a 200-year period, but it came to a halt in 1947. We now have some detachment from it. In any case, India never reacted with rancor and bitterness. I have a, a story which may be apocryphal that I heard from a reliable source in my book about Nehru uh, being asked by Churchill, how is it that despite us putting you in jail for 10 years of your life, you bear no bitterness towards us? And Nehru is said to have replied um, that um, you know, I was taught by a great man, Mahatma Gandhi, never to fear and never to hate, which is a wonderful way of looking at it. I, I think it's, that's not the whole story because we are too much of a forgive and forget culture. And my book is an attempt to say to Indian people, forgive by all means, because hatred and bitterness is really not, these are not healthy emotions. Forgive, but don't forget. Because remembering is vital. I think young people in particular, I see a lot of young people in the audience here. If you don't know where you've come from, how will you appreciate where you're going? You really must have, it seems to me, that consciousness of the past, just as you'd like to know a little bit, I hope, about your parents and your grandparents. As a society, you need to know what your culture, your civilization, your country has been through. I would, uh, I would absolutely agree with that. But just coming to the book again, and you spoke briefly about uh, where India was in 1600 when the East India Company um, set up shop. In your book, you talk about the British claim to unifying India, and there are several, and you also argue that, that yes, there were collaborators within the country, whether they were the Brown Sahibs, the princes who sort of were complicit in the colonial project. So what do you Absolutely. Think? Well, look, I mean, every colonial enterprise has the so-called collaborators, the native informants, uh, the comprador capitalists, all of that. This is classic, um, classic sort of colonial studies 101. I don't need to belabor it. Uh, no colonial enterprise works without some collaboration from some of the locals. And India was absolutely no exception. There definitely uh, was collaboration. Uh, we were also very much divided amongst ourselves. Uh, the stories I tell in the book, I mean, there's... Of course, the classic one is the very first, the Battle of Plassey, where, where Sirajudallah is defeated because Mir Jafar, his cousin and courtier, uh, has bribed the British uh, and has supported the British to overthrow his own cousin. Then Mir Jafar comes to the throne, and 10 years later, his cousin and courtier, Mir Qasim, pays off the British to unseat Mir Jafar and put him on. And 10 years after that, Mir Jafar comes back with more money. And the East India Company was in it for the money, so there was venality everywhere. I mean, I've, I've joked that the British took the Hindi word loot into their dictionaries as well as their habits. But they did. It was a word that was not known in England until the British came to India and acquired it, along with, along with the loot that came with it. Uh, or Tipu Sultan in Seringapatnam. I mean, he was one of the few Indian rulers who actually managed to win a few battles against the British. But when he was pretty much defeated and had retreated to his fort in Seringapatnam, it's an impregnable fort surrounded by a moat full of water and crocodile. And there were secret passages under the water to come and supply you know, food and ammunition and so on. And the Brits just couldn't get in. So they were essentially running out of supplies themselves and made, thinking of lifting the siege. When again, uh, a, a, a courtier of uh, Tipu Sultan's betrayed them to the British by revealing the location of a gate under the water from which the British could come. So when I went there as a tourist with my sons, I remember the tourist guide saying, Sir, first water gate, Siringapatnam. Second water gate, Washington. Because the water gate, the water gate was lifted up. For so, what's to come. the what so is our that? capacity for betraying ourselves is there? So, this capacity for betraying ourselves demonstrates to us that this idea of India that we keep talking about as being this one idea of India is doesn't really exist. I mean, you know, you don't, no, that's there's no compunction true. of you know sort of selling out to rulers or to of, of being complicit. Then, what is this idea of India that? No, because. The territorial idea of India and the civilizational idea of India both go back literally to the Vedic era. I mean, you can actually read in the Rig Veda references to Bharat as the land between the Himalayas and the seas. Uh, and you've seen throughout our history attempts to unify this land. So you go back to Ashoka and Chandragupta, 3rd century BC, and they're controlling 90% of the territory of the subcontinent, including indeed chunks of what's today Afghanistan. 
Uh, you see, of course, the Mughals, particularly Akbar and Aurangzeb, got it up to about 95% of the subcontinent. So they were trying to fulfill territorially what civilization they'd always been seen. Then there is what um, uh, Diana Eck, the Harvard scholar, calls the sacred geography of India. Adi Shankara from Kerala, Shankaracharya, traveling in the late 8th century, the entire length and breadth of the subcontinent, establishing his muts, his religious uh, shrines in, in Kashmir, in Gujarat, in Odisha, and in the south, uh, shows you that there was already the sense of the civilizational space occupied uh, 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 by India. And, and if you think that's a purely Hindu idea, it's not because you can read Maulana Azad talking about how Hajj pilgrims from India, whether they came, whether they Pathans from the northwest or Tamils from the southeast, Indian Muslims were seen by the Arabs and by other Muslims uh, receiving them at the Hajj as all being from one recognizable civilizational space. They were all Hindis. They were all from Al Hind. Al -Hind yeah. So this idea is a worldwide idea that there is this one common civilization. And I would argue that the very fact that despite all the disunity we've talked about, at various times, various rulers tried to conquer all of it and ultimately were held back by technology, by relatively poor communications in the earlier days. Eventually, somebody would have succeeded. It happened to be the Brits, but somebody else definitely, had it just been an Indian ruler, would have knit the entire subcontinent together. They'd all been trying for 3,000 years. But what about, you know, can I bring you to the present uh, where you're a member of parliament, this is your second term. Now, as a Congress member of parliament, when off the record or in the Central Hall of Parliament, when, you're, when you talk to your colleagues in the BJP, in the ruling party, and, and in other parties in, in the left in Kerala, do you talk about these ideas of India, for example? Would you shake hands across the aisle and say, yes, we must do things together, which don't necessarily show up um, in parliament otherwise? Yes, now if you mean across the political divide, or do you mean across, across the, the political divide? Now, across the political divide, I would say that many of us try to, uh, but that unfortunately the political climate has become much, much too mutually hostile for truly bipartisan efforts to succeed. I'll give you one very simple example as I, on my own initiative, assembled a bunch of experts and a bunch of NGOs for a round table on air quality. We have an air quality crisis in our country. Uh, the air in Delhi is unbreathable every winter and not very breathable the rest of the year. So we need to do something about this. We need an action plan. Learn no from government. Bhutan, I would say. Uh, Bhutan is beautiful in that respect. You can, you know, get up in the morning and do your pranayama, but do not practice pranayama in India. You'll just pollute your lungs much worse than if you just breathe. Uh, so, <laughs> so I can... <laughs> but, um, but just to say that... Um, I invited a number of BJP MPs. They all pulled out before the event. And what is more, a party currently flirting with the BJP got instructions from its leadership, do not go to this event because a Congress MP is convening it. So this kind name of- Name of freedom of speech and expression which this festival, this festival is about, would you like to name the party? I, I'll, tell you, I'll tell you off the record no, after, matter, after yeah. the word. But you know, there's a nice video camera running and I have no interest in stirring up trouble for well-meaning people. But the fact is that uh, at the end of the day, we do need to work together. And you're, you're right in your question that there are certain interests which definitely transcend. Let me say one thing, however, in a more positive spirit. As chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee, the External Affairs Committee of Parliament, I would say that on foreign policy issues, we are still largely bipartisan. I have always argued there is no such thing as a Congress foreign policy and a BJP foreign policy. There's only Indian foreign policy. And for the most part, remember, I chair a committee, the majority of whose members are BJP, or the largest single party because it's proportional, the membership. Nonetheless, we have, <coughs> we've never had a, a disagreement or a dissent note. The committee has submitted 16 reports in the last three years. Including on India and its neighborhood? Absolutely. We just like submitted a report on India-Pakistan relations. How contentious can you get? And yet there was no dissent note. It was a unanimous report. What about I'm Bhutan? very proud of the fact that on Bangladesh, uh, I steered the constitutional amendment through the committee, right. bringing on board the Trinamul Congress, the Communists, the, um, the, the, the BJP and the Congress and others onto a common platform on the desirability for this initiative, mm -hmm. which of course had been started during the UPA government That's right. and was brought eventually to a vote by the BJP government. But on these issues, I felt that the country really had to have a united view. You know, the question on reaching across the political divide was, uh, was spurred by your mentor, Tipu Sultan and the treat in Seringapatnam. 
and how he was uh, one of the rulers who sort of, um, you know, the, who talked about this idea of India. But in today's India, there is this move to dethrone Tipu Sultan. You know, history has become contested territory in our country. Um, we've seen this starting with the Ram Janmabhumi movement, which was the first very major nationwide effort to essentially, and I'm putting it crudely, to take revenge upon history. And, um, and, and I think that this is most unfortunate, not just because you can't undo what was done centuries ago. You can simply create new wrongs and new injustices against people who are innocent of the old wrongdoings. But also because, as I've argued, history is its own revenge. I, I, I rather enjoyed the fact that when my book came out in India, in fact, the very week that Vice President Ansari launched the book in Delhi, the new, then new Prime Minister of Britain, Theresa May, was about to arrive in India. And she was going on to Hyderabad and Mumbai and Bangalore, cap in hand, looking for investments from Indian companies in her feared to be faltering post-Brexit economy. So I said, that's all you need. You don't need to have revenge upon the British. History is its own revenge. But if history is its own revenge, would you then say that uh, governments in power post-independence are looking at, the, at our inheritance, which is, you know, which is what the British gave us, which is the divide and rule project? Yes, I do talk at some length in the book about divide and rule, which was a conscious policy of the British. Lord Elphinstone wrote a celebrated memo um, in 1858 after having seen what happened in the Indian Revolt of 1857, the Hindu and Muslim soldiers fighting together side by side against the hated foreign oppressor and under each other's command, by the way, uh, and under the nominal flag of the, of the enfeebled Mughal monarch. And Lord Elphinstone wrote a memo saying, uh, divide et impera, Latin for divide and rule. Divide et impera was the old Roman maxim and it shall be ours. And they systematically set about creating separate communal consciousness in the various communities of India who had hitherto worked together and cooperated together across the board. And while some of it may have been relatively harmless, such as the, um, the setting up, for example, of educational institutions for the Muslim community to uh, give them, quote unquote, modern education that wasn't available in the madrasas, um, there were also some very deliberately malicious actions. I give a, num a number of examples in the book, but one because Jyoti mentioned the founding of the Muslim League, the British helped found the Muslim League. They actually encouraged the Nawab of Dhaka and others to do this. But just the previous year, in 1905, when Bengal was to be partitioned by the British, it was explicitly sold as an effort to create a Muslim majority state in East Bengal. And at that point, the senior Muslim nobleman who was the Nawab of Dhaka, who was an Oxford-educated chap, uh, said, what a beastly idea, I shan't stand for it. So the British quietly slipped him 100,000 pounds and he changed his tune. This was essentially how divide and rule was propagated very, very systematically. When grudgingly the British created very limited uh, franchise for elections to the uh, legislative councils and the provincial councils, and very limited, I mean, you know, as late as the 1920s, only one out of every 250 Indians had the vote. But when they did that, they still created communal electorates so that Muslims and Christians and Sikhs and Hindus all had to vote for candidates from their own community, for seats reserved for their own community, so that you actually had separate lists of voters based on communal grounds. What more could you want to create a, a sense of political interests of each community, religiously defined, being different from, from those of the rest? But Shashi, uh, India's refusal to learn from this history, you know, this divide and rule project of communal electorates. Now, the partition of Bengal was reversed in 1911, only six years after it was partitioned. That but, happened again in 47. Absolutely, and again in 1971. But in today's India, what is this revenge that we're taking up on history? No, I think, I think today's battles are really about the present. History is being used like a battle axe. It's not actually being used as, as an objective pursuit of any, any, anything. It is about people asserting a certain vision for themselves in the present. And we know, for example, uh, I'll, I'll give you one concrete example relating to my book. When I speak of 200 years of foreign rule, our prime minister and his allies speak of 1,200 years of foreign rule. Mm -hmm. 
Now, there is a big difference here. Because I'm speaking about the British as having come here, ruled our country for the benefit of a country far away. Whereas for the Prime Minister, Muslim rulers who originally came to India from, from abroad, but stayed in India, assimilated, intermarried, and remained, they are also considered foreigners to him. To me, they're not foreigners. They built in this country. They remain in this country. In fact, apart from the first Mughal, every other one had a Hindu mother, had, a, had an Indian mother. Uh, the, if they're told they looted and stole, as they're accused of doing, they spent their loot here. They didn't send it back to Fergana or the... Or, perhaps or you the, should speak of 400 Bell. years of, of British rule from 1600. No, at that point, they were traders. And in fact, uh, in 1600, the British had no real clout for about 100 odd years. They were supplicants and they were treated very much. As, as, as supplicants by the big monarchs. The first British ambassador to India uh, was Sir Thomas Rowe in 1614, who presented his credentials to the court of Jahangir and was treated as a rather minor uh, ambassador from a smallish country far away. I mean, this is literally the way in which the, the Mughals could treat them. Uh, but the British rapidly realized that tr free trade is all very well, but free trade at the point of a gun gets you better profits. Right. And that's what the East India Company began doing from the 1700s on, or late 1600s onwards. And the Mughals made the mistake of giving them very limited control of territories around ports. Um, uh, and I think that's the basis from which the British was, were able to interrupt the, tri the thriving free trade that India had enjoyed to impose eventually their own terms of trade on us. Okay. So the British claim of unifying India, of giving us a free press, the of, railways, of the railways, trains ran on time, a parliamentary system, you know, an MP like yourself would never be one if we didn't have the British. No, no. <laughs> I, it's too long an answer in the, in the, I fear, the limited time available because I think we're taking questions from the audience too. But just to say that, you know, the railways were brought in uh, entirely for British purposes in order to extract resources from the interior of India and bring them to the ports or to move troops into the hinterland in order to control any possible unrest. Um, and they were not built for, for the benefit of Indians at all. Indeed, even the construction of the railways was a gigantic colonial scam in which the British made indecent profits guaranteed by money paid by the Indian taxpayers so that a single mile of Indian railway cost nine times what the same mile cost at the same time in the US and Canada because the British were spending money hand over fist since they were guaranteed a rate of interest, double that of the highest rate of interest of any British government securities in England. So it was the safest and highest investment possible in the London Stock Exchange from about the 1840s to the 1870s was investing in the Indian railways. And they cheerfully called it private profit at public risk except the private profit was all British and the public risk was all Indian. So the railways were not a gift to India. They were a profit-making scam for the colonialists to further their own interests and their own control. And so it goes. All the other examples, rule of law is mentioned, but um, rule of law was applied by the British with excessive attention to the skin color of the defendant, so that in 200 years, there were thousands of cases of Englishmen killing Indians and only three cases in which people were actually punished for murdering Indians. In everything else, an excuse was found. One of the most common ways in which the English killed Indians was people kicking their domestic servants to death. And uh, this was justified by an entire theory that all Indians were malarial and therefore had enlarged spleens. And so they died of a ruptured spleen rather than of being murdered by the British kick. And Punch magazine even wrote an entire verse, an ode to the stout British boot because the boot was the instrument of killing. And so it goes. I can give you examples. You must read the book, because all the examples are there. I do want to say one thing, Jyoti, if I may, because we began with atonement. Yeah. And when I speak of atonement, I do want to stress, I've, I, you know, the book actually um, is doing reasonably well in Britain, surprisingly. Okay. And I often ask, so what, what would you like? What do you want us to do about this? And I, I, I give them a very clear answer. The first is that they should um, uh, end this historical amnesia. You can do... A-levels in history in Britain today without learning a line of colonial history. That must change. They must teach their children the truth and the unvarnished whole truth and not just the romanticized glorious stuff. Second, construct museums, construct places where school children can go and see colonialism. I have written to our government saying we should convert the Victoria Memorial in Calcutta into a museum of colonialism of the British Raj in India. And so far, to my disappointment, even the BJP government and, and indeed, Mamta Banerjee's government, neither government has risen to the bait. But I'm going to continue pushing this. I think it needs to be done. But then the final thing I've said uh, goes back to this, this horror that we all know as Jallianwala Bagh. 
because the centenary of Jallianwala Bagh, which in my mind is the single worst atrocity of the Raj, not in terms of numbers. The British killed 100,000 people in Delhi alone, on the streets of Delhi, in 1858 after putting down the so-called mutiny. So in terms of numbers, Jallianwala Bagh was relatively smaller. But the entire context, I'll take two minutes to tell you why. The Indians had supported the British in the First World 1919. War. 1919. Yeah, Jale I'll come back to that. Uh, in the First World War, India had supported the British. Even Mahatma Gandhi called for support to the British effort. India had sent 1.3 million men, pack animals, carts, vehicles, food, rations, clothing, money, vast sums of money. Uh, the total, and even rail lines were stripped out of the ground and sent off to aid the war effort. The total Indian contribution in today's money, but allowing for inflation, is about 80 billion pounds sterling. It's an enormous contribution. Britain could not have fought the First World War without India. In exchange, what India was supposed to get was, quote unquote, progressive self-government, by which Indians understood there would be dominion status, the same status involved, enjoyed by the white countries of the Commonwealth. Australia, Canada, New Zealand, South Africa, under which the Queen would still rule, there'd still be a Governor General, but Indians would be elected to office beneath that. And that was more or less what was expected, but the British betrayed the promise at the end of the First World War. Not only did they break their word, but they actually imposed the stringent Rowlett Acts, which restored wartime emergency era restrictions on things like freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, freedom of the press, and so on. Protests broke out, and when protests broke out, the British essentially declared martial law. They didn't use that word, but they sent generals and brigadiers to keep the peace in various places. In Punjab, in Amritsar, General Dyer, Brigadier Dyer, arrived with a contingent of soldiers. And when he was there, he had declared the equivalent of Section 144, that people couldn't all gather. More than five people couldn't gather in one place at one time. And then he heard there was a gathering in a place called Jallianwala Bagh. Now, what he didn't bother to find out was it was Baisakhi, the big harvest, the spring festival of Punjab, and a lot of these people had come from surrounding villages to gather, essentially to have a good time, commemorate the festival. There were women, there were children, uh, and of course they were hearing some speeches uh, uh, which may not have been particularly pro-British in those days, but they had no arms or weapons, they were not there to fight anybody, they were just there for Baisakhi. Dyer shows up with his soldiers, he doesn't issue a warning, he doesn't fire a warning shot, he just instructs his soldiers to open fire directly onto the defenseless unarmed men, women, and children. He stations them at the only entrance to the garden, but Jalemwala Bagh is a garden with one, it's a walled garden with just one gate. And he, he explains later to a commission of inquiry, it's because that made them easier targets. They were all rushing to escape at the gate, so he shot them more easily. He proudly said not one bullet was wasted. Every bullet either killed somebody or wounded somebody badly. At the end of this horror, he shut the gate and would not let the relatives tend to the dead, the dying, and the wounded, who were forced to rot for 24 hours in the hot sun without even a drop of water. Many more died unnecessarily because of that cruelty. He ordered Indians to crawl on their bellies on a nearby street. So if they so much as lifted their heads while crawling, the heads would be bashed down by British staves. And at the end of all of this, the British actually, the House of Lords passed a resolution praising him, the House of Commons did condemn him, the British then raised a subscription to reward him. And it was equivalent in today's money of a quarter of a million pounds sterling for having killed Indians. And, and he was presented to him with a bejeweled sword. Rudyard Kipling, that flatulent voice of Victorian imperialism, hailed him as the man who saved India. So this entire mixture of things, the betrayal of the promise, the actual massacre and the cruelty, the indifference to Indian suffering that followed the shootings, the racism and the self-justification afterwards, all of this put together, to my mind, makes Jallianwala Bagh the most fitting example of everything that was wrong about British colonialism in India. And the centenary of this event is coming up on the 13th of April, 2019. So what I've suggested is, if on that date, a member of the British royal family, because everything was done in the name of the crown, could come to Amritsar, could go to Jalayamwala Bagh, ideally like Willy Brandt in Poland, could sink to their knees and express contrition, remorse, apology for the wrongs that were done, that would have a terrifically cleansing effect. Okay, so we hope that the applause in Bhutan will reach the streets of London and perhaps Buckingham Palace. The palace. Now, 
Uh, we have five or six minutes left, so it's wonderful to see so many young people here, lots of students. Uh, questions for Mr. Sh Mr. Tharoor? Are you going to choose the question? Yes, I am. The young lady here. Would you like to identify yourself, please? Yeah. Uh, good morning to you all, distinguished English guests, and all the ladies and gentlemen here. I'm Sringam, and I'm from Gedi College of Business Studies under the Royal University of Bhutan. Uh, my question for sir is out of my general curiosity. So I just want to ask sir that, sir, you have written so many books so far. So now, when you look back to those uh, writing, of yours, uh, do you ever felt or you feel that there need to be some changes or improvements in the book? Do, do, when you look, you've written so many books, when you go back, do you feel that you could have changed something? Ah, it's a very good question. You know, it's like asking a parent, when you look at your child, do you wish we had changed something when the child was born? <laughs> You know, once the book is born or the child is born, it has to find its own way in the world. It's a reflection of the time in which you wrote the book. It reflects your own state of mind, your own thinking, your own ideas at that time. Every book, without exception, is infinitely perfectible. But then, you know, you can't go on like that. When you create something, at some point you have to create it and let it be. Now, obviously, when it's a purely factual book, if there are some printing mistakes or some mistakes of fact, those you can correct in subsequent editions. Um, but uh, my novels, for example, um, there's no point thinking, oh, I could have written this differently. The novel is a work of its own time. It stands, it tells a story, it walks on its own, and you should essentially try and embrace it for what it is the way it, the way it is. Okay, we have time for uh, two, two, three more. Give two questions. Yes, ma'am. Short questions, please, and then the gentleman after that. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, just just speak up because we don't have time. Yeah. Would you like to stand up, ask, identify yourself, please? Independent right. Okay. that how it works in Well, uh, divide and rule was introduced by the British for their purposes of control. Whereas today, politicians are using uh, divisive appeals to identities and sub-identities in order to mobilize votes. I deplore it as much as you do. I've written uh, in many of my books about this. Um, uh, I, I, you know, 25 years ago, I came up with a bad joke about in India, very often, when you cast your vote, you vote your caste. Uh, which, you know, shouldn't, shouldn't be happening. Um, I, I, I've written that um, if Nehruji hadn't been cremated, he'd be rolling over in his grave because he actually thought caste would disappear. And, you know, his own party, along with all, all other parties, are looking very much to caste identities and other identities. Uh, it's a way of mobilizing support, which I believe should change. I have written in hope that our politics will move from a politics of identity to a politics of performance, where you vote for what the politician has done in office or promises to do in office, rather than whether he belongs to your caste or your religion or your subgroup or your clan. We're not getting there yet, but you know, 70 years is young in the life of a democracy, and as we mature, I hope we will move more towards performance. Yes. Okay. Morning, sir. Uh, I'm Dr. Blai Tempa, and I'm from Sikkim. And I want to ask a question like, uh, um, so you're talking about teaching historical facts, right? What about the India's system in 1975? Do you have to say anything, sir? No, what's your question? India's what? Yeah. For teaching. The mic is going in and out. You yeah. can hold it close to your mouth. And yeah. Yes. The nervous, sir. Okay. So you're talking about teaching historical facts? Yes. Know about like uh, India's stand on Sikkim in 1975? India's stand on Sikkim in 1970. Yeah, well, you know that um, Sikkim had a very special constitutional status. It was not the same as that of Bhutan uh, in the sense of while Bhutan had a treaty relationship with India, it was always recognized as an independent country, whereas Sikkim, from the days of the British Raj, was seen as a protectorate, which was constitutionally a different status. Now, one can have different political views 
about the circumstances of the uprising against the Chogyal at that time, but there's no question that there was a popular mass movement which uh, asked for integration with India and that uh, the plebiscite that was held was actually relatively fair. The vast majority of people did not uh, feel, I'm afraid, much allegiance to the campaign for separate status led by the Chogyal and his American wife. And so in the end, Sikkim became another Indian state. Now, 40 years later, this is an academic debate because the question isn't, isn't, shall we say, on the anvil anymore. And if you travel to Sikkim, you'll see people are very content. They rule themselves in free and fair elections. They send their representative to the Indian parliament and they, they, they are flourishing. They are an extraordinarily attractive state. Um, certainly, I think the, the, the only place in India that, that can come close to competing with Bhutan as of uh, tourist attractiveness Absolutely. is Sikkim. So uh, many of us are very proud that Sikkim is, is part of our constitutional structure. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, you Monica, get the last question. Monica. Yes, go ahead. Morning, sir, I'm Brigadier Mishra from Indian Army. Uh, sir, my question, in fact, uh, to tell you very frankly, I enjoyed every word of your speech in the Oxford Union. Thank you. And uh, I definitely believe in the concept of forgive but don't forget. However, when we do that, we end up uh, doing what Jyotiji mentioned, that we end up uh, writing and rewriting the history of revenges. It's very important for the Britishers to know that uh, when they came for ruling, ruling India, we were 27% of the global economy at that point of time. And by the time they left, we were in shambles. Uh, it's equally important, uh, and I uh, totally agree with you, for them to accept that some certain wrongs were done to, to us. And uh, what you have recommended about them giving even a notional compensation. But what is more important, uh, I feel, in the today's uh, context is how India should regain that status of going back to 27%, achieving the 27% of the global economy, rather than making Britishers accept that they did okay. wrong to us. So we just that is right. more important. Thank we'll you. Thank just quickly take a last question because this gentleman has been asking for one. Yes, sir, please uh, stand up and ask your question. We can just sort of combine the two. Yes, Aboli, uh, please, sorry. Yes, I th you have a loud enough voice, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, and uh, my question is, uh, I uh, completely agree with him uh, that the foreign policy should be benched on, uh, uh, you know, your question, please, I think we're really running out uh, of time. My question is that, uh, you know, in, term in terms of the uh, British, uh, uh, you know, rule in India and the way that uh, the Indian bureaucracy continues to have, to some extent, the Raj mind. Uh, to what extent do you believe that India's foreign policy, especially within the context of its neighbors, is still largely driven by this uh, perception? Thank you. Oh, excellent questions. Both of them, <laughs> not easy ones. Uh, Brigadier Misha, I, I, I would simply say that um, uh, we must obviously work in a positive direction. We are. I've actually said in places in the book that this is not about today and that I'm absolutely not using the past to either excuse any of our failures of today or, or to uh, let our own governments off the hook for what they have done and not done in the 70 years of Indian rule. This is about the past and it should stay in the past. So my view as an amateur historian is know the past but keep it in the past, embrace it in the past. And I agree with you, our focus should be on tomorrow and not on yesterday, but we should be aware of yesterday so that we know where we're going tomorrow, what we need to overcome. So we never get to 27%, frankly, that's not on the cards. Um, even China uh, is today at about 16% of global GDP, and I think one can't expect um, uh, us to move in that way. We, we, it's a different system, the world's a different place. But we certainly can be more successful, more prosperous, and give a better life to our own people, uh, and we need to focus on that. No quarrel with you on that. Sir, on, on, on India's uh, attitudes to its neighbors. Now, I should stress that to some degree, uh, to some degree, every big country has a problem with all its small neighbors. There's that wonderful line that uh, the Mexican statesman Porfirio Diaz had to say about the United States. When he said, my poor country, Mexico, he said, so far from God and so close to the United States. <laughs> so, you know, every, every small country uh, will, I mean, if you look at the Sark region, for example, India actually accounts for 70% of the population of all the Sark countries put together and 80% of the GDP. So inevitably, however modest and humble our bureaucrats should be, 
they will displace more weight than the rest put together around the table. The question is how to construct policies that will overcome that obvious difference in size. And many of us have advocated a, a more magnanimous approach of what we call asymmetrical relations, where India must consistently in the neighborhood give more than it takes. And I think by and large, this has been the approach. I don't think there's a quarrel within the bureaucracy about it, whether in terms of actual aid, the two billion to Afghanistan, the billion to Bhutan, the billion plus to Sri Lanka, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the monetary aspect, but also in terms of policy concessions. Certainly, I think the constitutional amendment that gave Bangladesh more territory than India took in, the, in redrawing the lines of partition was an example of saying, we can afford to give more to a smaller neighbor so that they too feel that they have come well out of this relationship. That, to my mind, is the only viable way. And in fact, if I had the risk of some immodesty during my brief tenure in the foreign ministry, I actually delivered a lecture making precisely this case, which uh, remains in many ways an accepted doctrine of Indian foreign policy. We do need to be humble. If there's arrogance from some of our people, that's regrettable. But certainly as a matter of policy, we need to be giving. No, no quarrel with you about that. Thank you, Shashi. Thank you for being a wonderful audience. A big hand to Shashi for you.